Okay, let's start off by going through this assignment. So the first question says, uh, the door in the microwave oven in includes a window made of metal mesh screen attached to the glass. Explain why this metal mesh screen is critical to the design. And it has to do with uh, us being made up of a lot of water. So you wouldn't want to be near the microwave. So that metal mesh screen helps protect us from uh, the water in our body from uh, the microwave oven. Uh, explain why people who use tanning beds should wear protective goggles. So, uh, so tanning beds give off uh, UVB light and UVB is uh, cancer causing and it could also damage our eyes. Okay. An x-ray technician may deal with dozens of patients requiring x-rays every day. Explain why it is important for the technician to operate the x-ray machine behind a shielded wall. Uh, so for three, x-rays are ionizing. And if you're around ionizing radiation all the time, it can give you cancer. Number four, rank the EMR from lowest energy to highest. So lowest is radio. And then microwave. And then infrared visible, UV, X-ray, and gamma. So that's from lowest to highest. Uh, rank EMR from lowest to highest frequency. So it's going to be the same thing. Frequency is the same as uh, the energy. And then from lowest to highest wavelength, well, it's going to be reversed. It's going to be gamma, X-ray, UV, visible, infrared, micro, and then radio. So, uh, and that has to do with, right, as frequency Oops, let me give myself more room. As frequency increases, wavelength decreases. So these really high frequency ones are going to have very, very small wavelengths. And then number seven, ultrasound is the preferred imaging technology for checking the development of an unborn child. Explain, <coughs> excuse me. Explain why x-rays are not used to monitor development of an unborn child. Well, x-rays damage fetuses. X-ray damages uh, multiply divi uh, rapidly dividing cells, so that would be bad. Uh, ultrasounds use sound waves, which are not ionizing and not dangerous. Uh, eight, the figure below shows x-rays. Uh, explain why the screws appear white in the image. So the more dense an object is, the... Uh, the whiter it appears, so the, the bones and the screws are both white. List the type of radiation that is ionizing and non-ionizing. Um, so non-ionizing include radio, micro, infrared, visible. And then ionizing includes UV, X-ray, and gamma. Uh, what type of radiation are most blocked by the atmosphere? Well, that's going to be gamma and X-ray. Okay. So let's do these sample diploma questions now. Uh, the three forms of EMR that are highest energy per photon. Uh, so the highest energy is gamma and then X-ray and then uh, ultraviolet in any order. You could have that. Uh, using the numbers above, choose one type of radiation, match it with some applications of the radiation, and then the classify, classification of the radiation. So you can use any of these. Uh, so if you picked one as your first one, uh, so infrared would be used for um, touchscreen devices, military sensors, uh, things like that. So anything that can see in the dark would be infrared. That would be five, and infrared is non-ionizing. Uh, X-ray which is probably the easiest one and most of you picked, um, would be six, seeing bones and treating cancer, and that is ionizing. And then if you picked radio waves, sending signals between cell phones, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging is what that stands for. Uh, so that's four. And then uh, radio waves are non-ionizing. So any of those three answers could be correct. Uh, the two types of EMR that can uh, be detected by an Earth-based telescope are, um, so it's the one that the atmosphere will block out, so it's going to be gamma and x-ray. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about some properties of light today. So curriculum points investigate and describe qualitatively the phenomena. So we're going to talk about reflection, refraction, diffraction, and polarization of light. So those are the four terms you need to know. And we're going to talk about telescopes. You need to know about reflecting and refracting and radio telescopes is what you need to know. So uh, light is thought to be both a wave and a particle, so it possesses properties of both. Uh, all waves can reflect, be polarized, diffract, and refract. So we'll talk about what all those words mean. So reflection is really easy, and with reflection, our angle of reflection equals our angle of incidence. So what that basically means is this angle here will always equal this angle here. So if this is 30 degrees, then uh, this is 30 degrees. Right? So it's a reflex off the surface like that. Easy peasy. Done with reflection. Uh, polarization might be a new one. You probably heard the term before, but uh, maybe you haven't you don't really know what it means. So I'll show you what polarization is. So this is right here, this is a polarizing filter. So you, you can see through it, right? Here's my hand underneath. You can see through it just fine. And if I put another polarizing filter by it, then um, it looks pretty much the same. But what I can do is I can take, let's try to make the reflection less. I can take this filter and I can rotate it 90 degrees. Now all of a sudden, all the light's blacked out and you can't see underneath it. Actually, let me make it full 90 degrees, right? So you can't see my hand underneath, but then I rotate it another 90 degrees and you can see my hand. So every time we rotate it 90 degrees, it blocks out all the light and then blocks out half the light. All the light, half the light, like that. So to explain why this happens, we know light to be a transverse wave. And we showed light as um, electromagnetic radiations. It's, it's perpendicular electro, electric and magnetic waves. So light kind of looks like this arrow here, right? So this is, I'm shooting light at myself. So we have an electric field here and a magnetic field here. So um, if this is... Hmm, there we go. You can sort of see that. So I'm shooting light into the, the table here. So light is, when it moves to the polarizing filter, the polarizing filter is like this. And you can picture there's tiny openings in the polarizing filter. So if I shoot the light in like that, this black band will be able to make it through. But this copper band right here and right here won't be able to make it through. It'll get cut off, right? So only half the light goes through. And if I put another polarizing filter by it, right, the same thing will happen. Only uh, the, black, the black line will be able to make it through, but the copper line won't be able to make it through. So this is when they're oriented in the same direction. If I take this and I rotate it 90 degrees, what ends up happening is those bars are now like that. So now the copper ones will make it through, but the black ones won't make it through. And if I stack these together, this will block off the copper ones, this will block off the black ones, and all of the light is going to be blocked afterwards. That's how it works. So because light is a transverse wave, which means it goes up and down like that, it can be polarized and half the light is blocked off, the other half is blocked off, and when we put them together, it blocks off all the light. So uses of polarization include uh, 3D movies use polarization. The movie shot with two different cameras, two different images, and one image is polarized, so only vertical light comes out. The other image is polarized, so only horizontal light comes out. And your 3D glasses block one of the images, so each eye sees a different picture. So this is what's happening. So both of the images come out of the screen, so the vertical light and the horizontal light, but your polarized glasses that you wear um, will only allow green light through here and will only allow the purple light through here, so you're seeing two different images. And what you're, 
What your brain does is when it sees two different images in each eye, it tries to focus it, and if it focuses it outside of the screen here, so it looks like it's popping out of the screen. That's how basically how it works. Another use of polarization is when light reflects off of water. It's mostly in the horizontal direction. Uh, so what that means is if I have, if this is my water uh, and my light comes down, this vertical line here is going to get cut off and only the horizontal gets reflected back up. So fishermen and boaters use polarized sunglasses to reduce glare off the water. Uh, what polarized lenses do is they block off um, all the horizontal light, right? So this is an image taken without a polarized filter and all that reflected light is coming up and you can't see the fish. Uh, so in the water here, you can see the fish because these are polarized glasses that are on it and it blocks all the, it blocks half the light basically and it blocks all that reflected light so you can only see the light in the, in the water there. So that's polarization. Uh, diffraction is the bending or spreading out of waves as they pass through an opening or around a corner. And waves diffract, particles do not. So to make diffraction happen better, uh, you can increase the wavelength. So that means that red light would diffract better than, than blue light. Uh, so which type of EMR would diffract the most? Oops. I stole my question. So it'd be red light. Red light has the longest wavelength of visible light that we can see. And which type of EMR? Oh, this is asking for EMR. So that's the wrong question. So, the, so radio has the longest wavelength. Uh, so radio would diffract the most. So lower frequency would diffract more because as we uh, increase the wavelength, we lower the frequency. And the opening that the wave diffracts through must be the same size or less than the wavelength. So just some properties of diffraction. So I'm going to show you what diffraction looks like here. Um, so as I send a wave through an opening, what it's going to do is it's going to spread out. So that means that, that if this is me over here and I'm speaking, that's a sound wave being shot out there. Uh, well, around the corner here, if someone was standing here, they would be able to hear what I was saying, right? They're not, they're not by the opening, but it's sort of bending out. And as you increase the size of your opening, you get less diffraction, right? So the waves don't bend around the corner there. So if someone was standing here with a bigger opening, they wouldn't be able to hear as well. So smaller openings work better as well. Uh, another example here. So lots of buildings have these sound shades in front of them. And this car drives by here. So as this car drives by, it honks its horn. So let's say it's got a dinky little horn and it's like beep, beep, beep. Well, that high note is going to have very short wavelengths. So what that means is if someone's living in this window here, because it's got such a short wavelength, none of that sound diffracts, right? None of that wave diffracts around there, so it doesn't bend around this corner, so you wouldn't be able to hear it on that bottom floor. But if this horn came by and it was like honk, honk, and it was a really low note, well, low notes they diffract better, right? Those longer wavelengths diffract better. So this, this sound bends around the corner and you'd be able to hear that low note very well. So yeah, diffraction is just bending around these corners, right? Or not bending around the corner or bending as they go through an opening. And water is a wave and you can see the beautiful diffraction pattern here as uh, the wave is going this way. So the wave is going that way there. And as it goes through the opening, it bends around the corner. So although the wave is coming from here, if I was standing on this rock here, uh, what would happen is I'd get waves hitting the shore here, and those waves are coming from behind because they're bending around that corner. Okay, so that's diffraction. And then we have refraction. Refraction is the bending of light when it goes from one medium to another. So here's a picture of it. Um, so it looks like this straw is going this way, and then all of a sudden in the medium, it bends that way. And we also see that this image here, it looks to be magnified. It looks to be a little bit bigger. And that's what uh, refraction can do. It can magnify things. So sometimes questions will have ray diagrams in them and you need to know what a ray diagram is. Um, so I can draw
and these two angles would be equal to each other. Refract. I'm going to draw that with a different color. What would happen is this is medium one, and then the light would go into medium two here, and you'd see that this is our angle, and this angle and this angle don't equal each other. That's what refraction is. So reflection is when it stays in the same medium, it just bounces off. Refraction is when it bends it as it enters a new medium. And here's a video that shows this idea of light bending. It shows refraction really well. So I'll play the video. Okay, so they have a prism here, and that causes there to be two different mediums. So there's a medium of air out here, and then there's a medium of the prism here. So what he does is he increases the angle right here. So this is the angle of light entering the prism. I'm just going to pause it. Oops. Yeah. So here he's about 20 degrees, so this angle of incidence is 20 degrees, but this refracted angle is about 30 degrees. Right? So now when he increases it to 30 degrees, we're about 45. So this angle here and this angle here, this is air, this is the prism, um, are different. Right? And you can see it's more pronounced. And as this angle gets bigger, what happens is some of the light gets reflected. So you can see that this angle and this angle are the same. So this is a reflected light and um, those angles are the same. So this is a refracted light, this is a reflected light. Um, so telescopes work with this idea. There are two types of optical telescopes. We can use a refracting telescope, and refracting uses lenses. That's very important that you know that refracting uses lenses. Anytime they talk about lenses, they're talking about a refracting telescope. Um, the problem with refracting telescopes is that lenses are limited by their size. If they get too large, they start to bend, and if your lens bends, then uh, your image gets distorted, which isn't good. Uh, lenses can also absorb infrared and UV, so if you're trying to look at that through your telescope, um, it's not going to work very well. The other type of uh, telescope you can have is a reflecting telescope, and they use large curved mirrors, so reflecting uses mirrors, refracting uses lenses, and um, you can make the mirror as big as you want, and some are as big as 6 meters, some are even as big as 10 meters in diameter, so really big mirrors for telescopes to, for seeing things in outer space. So this is a picture of them, um, so this is uh, a mirror here, so you know that it's a reflecting telescope. So the light comes in, it reflects off this mirror, and then you can see the image here. A refracting telescope, the light comes in, a lens bends it, and then another lens bends it. So then you can see that image, and what it does is it ends up magnifying it if you have curved lenses or curved mirrors. Okay, so we'll watch this video on how telescopes work. As you watch this video, think about how telescopes collect light to form an image of a distant object. Because of the vast distances between us and other objects in the universe, the light from most stars takes many years to reach Earth. Even light from the closest star to Earth, aside from our Sun, called Proxima Centauri, takes 4.2 years to reach Earth. And the light from most of the other stars has taken thousands and sometimes millions or even billions of years to reach us. Distant objects are hard to see because light from an object spreads out. So the farther you are from the object, the less light you receive from it. But conventional telescopes magnify this light. Light collecting telescopes use glass lenses or mirrors to gather the rays of incoming light. When you look through the eyepiece of a conventional telescope, you see a very small part of the sky, 
but that part is enlarged so you see it more clearly. Some telescopes have huge lenses and complex motors to slowly spin the telescope so it can remain focused on objects as Earth spins. The first telescopes were refracting telescopes. Refracting telescopes are shaped like long tubes. They usually have two lenses, a larger one at the front and a smaller one at the end where you look. The larger lens, called the objective, bends the light, forming an image. The bending of light as it moves from air to glass is called refraction. As parallel rays of light pass through the lens, they are focused at a single point, the focal point. The length from the lens to the focal point is the focal length. As light continues on and enters the second lens, the eyepiece, it is refracted again and then continues on to the viewer's eye. Refracting telescopes are limited because their lenses are made of glass. The world's biggest refracting telescope is only just over a meter in diameter. If a lens were much larger than this, the weight of the glass in the lens would actually make the lens sag and distort the image. A second type of telescope, the reflecting telescope, was designed by Sir Isaac Newton in 1668. As its name implies, a reflecting telescope has one or more mirrors that reflect light. This style of telescope can be much larger than a refracting telescope because it uses mirrors rather than an objective lens. Since light does not have to pass through the mirror, the mirror can be supported in the back so it can be much larger than a lens. In a reflecting telescope, light enters the telescope tube and is first reflected by the concave or bowl-shaped mirror called the main mirror in this diagram. The main mirror is shaped so that the light converges into a single focal point inside the telescope. Then the secondary mirror reflects the light onto the eyepiece, where a lens refracts the light into the observer's eye. The most modern reflecting telescopes are astounding. They rely on a series of mirrors working together to form a single reflecting surface. Their light collecting surfaces can be 10 meters or more in diameter. The light that makes its way to Earth passes through the atmosphere before reaching an observatory. As it travels through the atmosphere, the light is distorted. Water vapor, dust, heat, and other things in the atmosphere can all distort light. On a clear night, these factors are minimal. This is a photograph of Saturn taken through a telescope on a clear night. But this is what Saturn looks like when water vapor and other atmospheric phenomena distort its picture. In addition, the presence of light from street lamps, house lights, and other kinds of electric lights can reduce the clarity of a star's image. We call this light pollution. These disturbances in the atmosphere can make incoming light from distant objects refract and scatter and cause the light to shimmer and distort. At higher altitudes, these distortions aren't as great, so telescopes are often built on mountaintops. This helps, but doesn't entirely eliminate distortion. To do that requires locating a telescope outside Earth's atmosphere, in space. So another type of telescope you can have is a radio telescope that see radio waves. So stars not only produce visible light, but they also produce other radiation. And the nice thing about radio signals from stars is they can travel through clouds and they can travel through visible light. So you can look at the radio waves of the telescope um, or of the star any time of day. So when it's cloudy, um, when, it's, when it's daytime, as opposed to optical telescopes where it needs to be nighttime and it needs to be a really clear night. So the telescopes have an advantage over optical telescopes. They can operate day or night and the weather doesn't matter. Um, the only downside to radio telescopes is cell phones work on radio and like radios in your car work on radio telescopes. So you have to place them really far away from any sources of radio waves. Um, 
So one thing you can do with radio telescopes is uh, interferometry. And interferometry is uh, when you link two or more telescopes together. So you have a telescope collecting light here and a telescope collecting light here. And you can link those two images. It's kind of when, like when you do panorama on your cell phone. Uh, when you put on the panorama cam camera, it will take a whole bunch of images and link them all together so you get a bigger overall image. So you can have other types of telescopes. You can have X-ray telescopes. Uh, the problem with X-ray telescopes is that you can't have them on Earth because our atmosphere will block those X-rays. So EMR from space can be blocked by our atmosphere. So certain types of EMR can only be viewed from a space telescope. Um, so that includes X-ray telescopes. If you want to look at the X-rays given off by stars, um, then that's what you'd want to do. Black holes also give off a lot of x-rays. Um, so if you want to look at a black hole, uh, you would have to, or you want to detect the x-rays coming off a black hole, you'd have to do that with a space-based telescope. And this is the most common, uh, the, or this is uh, the most famous x-ray telescope. It's called the Chandra x-ray telescope. And you can't use reflecting systems because those x-rays will penetrate right through. So they have mirrors at very small angles and it helps focus those. And then you just need a computer detector here to detect those x-rays. Okay, that is it. I will attach an assignment and this is a nice short video. So uh, if you have any questions, let me know.